Okay. Lots to talk about, so we're not gonna, we're just gonna cut to the chase. Psi, Agent X, the stuff's in the program, so let's get on with it. Surveillance. Why are we doing surveillance in this talk? 1983, if you said to someone surveillance, this is what they would think about. They wouldn't think about the, the global technical surveillance that's going on at the moment. Facebook. So, are you a target? It's entirely possible that you are. Some people that maybe in this room have been targeted. These, all these people have, been, have spoken at DEF CON or run DEF CON. Uh, and where's the pointer? There you go. So the guy all the way on the right is actually Zach Franken who was speaking, who ran DEF CON for 15 years. And you know DEF CON might also be targeting you. This is Michelle Madigan. Some of you, you were there. This is a, uh, this was basically a sting reporter who tried to sting DEF CON so we stung them with our own undercover team. Yeah. So yeah, real physical surveillance, really good times. In a hostile environment. Yeah. However, if your office at home looks like this and you never leave your house, then you're probably not a target. Although it does look a bit like Major Malfunction's office. But this is way neater. Yeah, way neater. I mean, like cleaner. <laughs> so, who's likely to be conducting surveillance? We've got the obvious three letter agencies the NSA, FBI, CIA, KFC. <laughs> Okay, maybe not KFC, unless you're trying to sell the secret recipe to North Korea. But, you know, a lot of companies have the ability to engage surveillance teams if they require them. A lot of government departments, especially in the UK, you know, local government can hire and bring in surveillance teams. Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs are looking for fraud. They have dedicated surveillance teams. And also, you as an individual can go and get trained. So this is uh, a UK company run by an ex-military surveillance operator. So you provide two forms of ID, pay your money. If you pass the course, you get a formal qualification. So you become formally qualified in advanced surveillance techniques for only £2,300. So that's like in Brexit money, that's like 200 bucks. Yeah, pretty much. So one important fact we have to point out right at the very beginning of the talk is all surveillance operators and all vehicles involved in surveillance have what is called a heat state. Your heat state starts at 10 at the start of an operation or the start of an operational day. And every time you come into contact with the target or are exposed to the target, your heat state drops to the point where, for example, if you crash your car into their car, you end up toast, okay? At the end of the day, all of the operators will actually say what they think their heat state is. So your mission as a person that may be under surveillance is to rate or to get their heat state to drop or make toast. Now, surveillance itself, three main stages of surveillance, the pickup, the follow and the housing. The majority of the talk is going to be about the follow because that's where most of the fun happens, but we will talk quickly about the pickup, because this is important, it is getting control of a target at the beginning of an operation, or the beginning of an, of an operational day. Um, and they need to give a description of the target, uh, where they are, and where they're going. And this can be done in a number of ways. We can use static observation posts. This could be a neighboring property, for example. Yeah, so this is uh, the big white building. That's the uh, Russian embassy in Washington. And uh, the building across the street, that's uh, the FBI st static surveillance post that they've owned and operated for years. <laughs> and it's very obviously a static observation post. Like, people are like, oh, what's with the giant cameras and the skylights? And no one goes through the front door. They always go through the back door on the adjacent street. They can also use static covert cameras. Um, again, with modern technology, they can fit a camera, monitor it re remotely, uh, and pick up the targets as they leave. Or they can use a mobile observation post. Now, I will cover this briefly. This is an ex-FBI 1989 Dodge surveillance vehicle that some guy... Fucked bought, up. Yeah. <laughs> bought at an auction and then videoed it and put it on YouTube. Now, 
On the top there, that houses the antenna. Each of the lights were fitted with microphones front and back. All of the roof mounts were fitted with cameras and inside we had a full suite of video and audio recording, a toilet and aircon. Obviously we've got to keep them happy. That's a pretty nice van. So yeah, pretty nice van. Obviously not as nice as this van. No. So if you see this part on your street, you've really screwed up, yeah? Yeah. Or they can use a surveillance vehicle. Now, one point of a surveillance vehicle is, is a lesser known technique, uh, and that's what's known as a boot fit or a trunk fit for you Americans out there. Um, this is a specially adapted vehicle where the operator is in the trunk of the vehicle. Not comfortable, however, they have the ability to observe, to video, to take pictures, and it is very effective in certain circumstances because a big ass van parked in this street would be obvious, whereas this could be a boot fit. So very limited time because obviously this, the operator inside is at risk. However, you know, it works. Yeah. Now, in the program we said these techniques have been around for years. They've changed little. This is a film made in 1974 by the Brits and shared with our American friends under our special relationship. So special. So special. Uh, and this covers the pickup. Sequences have been shortened. Moving. As you say in the adverts. And south. Brown Roger. I love this Green music. Roger. The escort has remained stationary. The target passes the second car, who in turn sends the information that will enable the third car to take up the chase. From Brown, now moving west. Let's look at that sequence again, as seen from the target's rear view mirror. He pulls away and moves off down the road. Nothing to arouse his suspicions. And at approximately one kilometre away from home, the green magnum pulling out to take control of the follow appears as part of the normal traffic pattern. Although he has seen nothing, the target has been under surveillance most of the time. And a key point there is under surveillance. They are not following you. They are not right behind you. Ooh. Thank you. <laughs> um, so within the follow, especially in a vehicle follow, you can lose the vehicle. It doesn't matter if you lose a vehicle, especially if you're on a long operation, it's better to lose the target than compromise the operation and make them aware they're under surveillance. Now you heard them talking on the radios, obviously very old. Nowadays, for brevity, we use brevity codes. This makes it easier for the team to communicate. It also hides things like locations and directions of travel, as you'll see, because if they're not using encrypted communications, you can intercept this, and anyone listening might be aware of what's going on. So here we see, standby, that's the target, out of his house, wearing a red baseball cap, blue top, grey trousers and black shoes. Target getting into his car, now moving off, turning less toward the junction of High Street and Water Lane. Now anyone listening and picking that up on the radio knows exactly where that person is and what direction they're going. So we use brevity codes. 77 Alpha 1 from Charlie 1, blue on grey, black shoes, red cap. Complete Bravo 1, mobile 91, yellow 2. Sounds gobbledygook, but the team understands. The last part there is using what we call spot codes, which are on spot maps, and again, for ease of reference for the team to be able to give the location of a target and a direction of travel rather than saying that they're on this road travelling towards the village of Earl Shilton as you can see here we can simply say at red 6 intending right committed 91 red 5 everyone understands where the target is and what direction they're heading and so this is kind of gets to something we have spot maps made up for the entire operational area. Everybody, every car of how many, what, there's like, how many cars? Potentially eight vehicles and 16 operators. Yeah, so you're looking at binders full of information, rapidly put together with a big team. This is not a cheap thing to do to, if you're doing it right. 
Um, it involves lots of teamwork, and when you can make a lot of toast, you can help break that team up, and thus ruin their effectiveness. So what are we looking for behind us if we think we're under surveillance? Obviously, they're going to be in a vehicle. If you're in Texas and they're all driving pickup trucks, they will be driving pickup trucks. If you're in a city, they will be in a sedan car. They will blend in with the environment. They will not be driving big ass SUVs <laughs> with government plates. Except in DC. Except in DC. Here is uh, an extract from a local paper in Iowa. And here we see, just in one state, the large number of license plates issued for covert work. This is because in a professional team, an agency level team, they will hold multiple license plates which they can change. And again, if you raise the heat state of that vehicle enough that they think it needs changing, they will change the license plate. This can't be done at the side of the road because someone unscrewing a license plate and screwing another one in, someone's going to call the cops and you don't want to have to explain what you're doing. So they will do this and they will have to leave the follow while it happens. Now, as we said, they will not drive directly behind you. They will use other vehicles as natural cover. There will be two or three vehicles behind you. Uh, they will use parallel routes to get ahead of you. But in America, you've made it really easy. You've come up with a block system in most of your cities. So here we have a standard FBI floating box. The target vehicle in red and the direction of travel. So the target vehicle turns, the message is relayed to all of the team, and at the next opportunity, all the vehicles turn. The target continues, the other vehicles come in behind, and the target is still within the floating box. So pulling up to a light, traffic light, and then just as it's turning to red, driving through, will not stop this, because there will be someone on a parallel route that can pick you up. So how do we get around this? How do we conduct anti-surveillance? Now, a quick point here. Anti-surveillance is what you do as an individual to try and detect a surveillance team. Counter-surveillance is when you use a third party to do that. So me as a good guy, I have my own good guy surveillance team follow me to see if they can identify the bad guy surveillance. That's counter-surveillance. When you're doing anti-surveillance, it's you on your own. And when you add a fourth team, it's counter-counter-counter-surveillance. Just to confuse things. Turtles all the way down. So quite simply, you can do simple things like vary your route. Use public transport. Um, and I don't mean from outside your house. Drive somewhere, park your car, get on a bus. Get in a cab. Because buses and cabs in most cities around the world can go places where normal vehicles can't. So if you're in a cab or a bus, they are not going to be able to follow you down this road. Also, they have to make a decision. If you get on a bus, why are you getting on that bus? Are you meeting someone on that bus? Are you doing something nefarious? Do they need to put someone on there with you? At that point, you are in control. You can observe everyone that gets on and watch them and make note of them. You need to be observant all the time. And so, of course, so one of the things we're doing here, right, is we're switching up the tempo on the, on, the, on the surveillance team. We're putting them on the back foot. We're forcing them to make decisions quickly that are awkward. 50-50 decisions. And if we're lucky, they'll make a 50-50 decision and it'll come out bad for them and good for us. We'll spot them because they're too close or we see them over and over again. And obviously, if they do try to follow you down here, they'll allow you to get stopped by this. And again, they then have to explain what the hell they're doing in the bus lane. We can use natural choke points. Now, here we have two villages circled. And if you drive around the road, around the lock here, it's about 47 miles. The roads are really crappy, and it takes a long time. However, between the two is a ferry. Again, if you're in an area where this sort of thing is, in, in the lakes area, in New York with car ferries, use this to your advantage. If you get on here, again, the decision comes. Are they going to drive 47 miles to try and catch the other side, or are they going to put one, two, three vehicles on here with you? At that point, again, you're in control. You can see and look at everyone that's on there. 
Another technique which surveillance operators are taught to recognise on a map before it happens is something called a long look. This is where you have a long straight road with no parallel roads and when the target hits this road they have a long look behind them so they could see lots of vehicles if they were in convoy, especially if it's not a very busy road. Again, a lot easier in the States. This, I sat in the middle of the road here and took a picture one way. This was eight miles long, this straight. There were no parallel roads. I saw one other car in four hours. So a surveillance team behind me on this road, I would hope I'd recognize them. The other thing about that is you're forcing the team to also do resource management. So they're going to have to put one car down that road because they can't put all of them down that road right after you. It sticks out, right? It breaks the pattern. And that's the thing. We, if we can figure out how to choke them and break the pattern, we're going to spot them. We can also use technology to our advantage. Uh, if you've got someone that can assist you, what you can do is have them at a choke point, at, say the morning, and they video every car that comes through before and after you for a period of 10 minutes. Then later in the day, at another geographic different location, again, do the same. Then you get two lists of license plates, compare the two, and if a license plate turns up on both lists, potentially that's a surveillance vehicle. Technology can help us. So the Open ALPR program, Automatic License Place Reader. So this is a bit of footage I took with an iPhone. In real time, there is the image. In the bottom right-hand corner, that's me running the image file through the software. Now the software reads the image file frame by frame. So you will have multiple instances of the same license plate. So again, we can use technology. We can run the software, extract it to JSON, convert that into uh, a SQL file. And that's not playing. Thank God we recorded the demo. Uh, yeah, and that is recorded. So the other thing, we, well, while this is running, there's other tools that do this. Amazon's facial recognition project, recognition. If you can do it for car, cars, you can do it for faces, right? So out of the box, SQLite on Kali doesn't support regular expressions, so we download and install a Perl regular expressions module, read in the SQL file, run a standard query, uh, we're using a regex here for the standard UK current license plate, which is letter, letter, number, number, letter, letter, letter. And as you'll see in the first set of results, you get some license plates which are quite similar. That's due to misreads in the software where the image might be slightly blurred and it can't recognize it. So to get around this, you can just do a standard SQL count and where you've got two similar license plates, the one with a higher count will be the real number. So we've now driven to where we're going to meet our contact, to pick up our data, and we're gonna park. And again, parking is a choke point. You're in control, you choose where to park. They have to decide whether they're gonna park in the same car park as you, because you may spot them. They may, especially if you go into a multi-story car park again, that's a choke point where you can observe. Now there's a misconception which comes from law enforcement uh, and the military that you must always, when you're doing this stuff, park your vehicle in reverse for a quick getaway. Surveillance operators are trained to blend in. The gray man. The gray man. So if everyone's nosy parked, as they are here, and you reverse park to someone that's surveillance aware, automatically your eye is drawn to that vehicle. Why is it parked differently? Again, we can see here, and to someone that is more observant than the rest of us, there's the one that's parked wrong. And how about that one? Anyone spot the one car that's parked in the opposite direction? It's right in the middle of the screen, dude. Right in the middle <laughs> of the screen. So, yeah. Again, if you're in a cab, you can get the cab to stop wherever you want. So drop me here. And if there's no parking, what do they do? If it's in a restricted parking area and they abandon their vehicle, they could lose their vehicle. Explain that one to your boss. You're, and so what we're doing is we're, we're adjusting the tempo, right? You jump out of the cab at the unexpected, at the, at the cross drive, which we've all done, I hope. I mean, this is Vegas. Uh, and uh, you, 
you basically force them to go from transition from a car tail to a foot tail, right? And they don't necessarily have assets that close and that quickly available. So it's gonna it's gonna mess things up for them. It's gonna make them make bad decisions. Now, when you're returning to your car, again, gives you a chance to observe, to look in the cars as you walk past. We said they're professionals, but they're also human, and humans do make mistakes. Um, so if you see maps in there, you may see other paraphernalia, uh, and this is a true story told to me by uh, a friend. Two surveillance instructors, not students, instructors, were visiting students on a covert observation post course, and they parked their vehicle and went on foot. Someone reported the vehicle as being suspicious, so the police turned up. The police looked in the vehicle, and sticking out from under the seat was a handset, not the sort of thing you see in a car in the UK. So they waited until they came back, and yes, explain to them what we're doing with our special car that says, please don't arrest us, we're doing surveillance training. We're cool, we're not criminals, we have a card, it's cool. Yeah, honest. honest. Um, and and one, of the, one of the clarification questions we were asked when we submitted the talk is, you know, why old school vehicle surveillance? You can put a tracker on there. Well, yes, you can, but if they're a technical uh, adversary, they can detect that. If they detect that, they know they're under surveillance. Also, yes, it's great, he stopped at the mall and I'm a mile away. So he's out of his car and in the mall, you get there, where is he? Right. The whole point of vehicle surveillance is to have enough people in contact with the target so that when he stops, you can deploy onto foot and continue the follow, purely and simply. The, the point of surveillance isn't to know where people go, it's to observe their behavior, right? What we're looking for is to see them doing the deed that made them interesting in the first place. So technical surveillance, you know, metadata surveillance is great. You know, Jimmy goes to Fry's every Tuesday and buys a hamburger. But frankly, that's not what we care about, right? We want to know who he, who he has, who he shares his, you know, hamburger with. So we're out of the car, we're walking along, they're out on foot. What do these people look like? Fucking badasses. <laughs> they always look like this. Media has told us that they always are gigantic, Badass white males. With short hair. Yeah, and big watches. So if you saw these two guys in the street, you'd think, oh my God, I'm under surveillance. Well, they've got earpieces that I can see. This guy has a wire from his radio sticking out of his shirt. This guy's got his push to talk button sticking out of his sleeve. And this guy has a holster, so he's armed unlikely to be surveillance. If these guys were following you, they are doing overt surveillance. They want you to know they're there. They're not there to see what you're doing. They're there so you can see them doing you. So these three people were part of a UK TV show. One is ex-GCHQ, one is ex-MI6, and one is an ex-MI5 surveillance operator. So who's who? So. Not, not the grey man, the grey person. They will use female operators because we're all fixated on short, big, tall, white man. You won't pay a second thought to this person sat on the bus next to you. Also, for newbies into surveillance, they fall into the habit of the unofficial uniform where they all dress so differently that they all dress the same, wearing black shirts. That never happens. No one ever wears black t-shirts and jeans all the time. What are you talking about? They wear khaki shorts and black t-shirts. That's their summer clothes. So they're on foot. They still need to communicate. They will have an earpiece. This will be a wireless earpiece. You will not see anything sticking out of their ear. If you've got big ears like me, you won't see anything. You might, if you're lucky and you get close enough, see the retractor stem on the earpiece. You need to get signals to the earpiece. So they wear an induction loop around the neck. This also has a microphone in it to transmit the data. The antenna is normally worn up the center of the back and across the shoulders in a T-shape for the best attenuation. 
and the press to talk switch or the pressle switch doesn't hang down your sleeve. It will be secreted somewhere else inside your clothing where it can't be seen. The whole kit is worn in a vest with the radio on one side, the battery on the other side to reduce bulk. So this is quite a lot of equipment that they're wearing and of course they have to wear clothing to conceal it. Now talking about clothing, they will utilise changes of appearance. Now, very old photographs. Um, I do love me a good Stasi archive. Yeah, they, these this are This is taken, where I get all my fashion tips. <laughs> these are taken from the Menor archives from the Stasi, which is, was the uh, East German secret police, who had a huge surveillance capability. Now, even nowadays, a, an agency-level surveillance team will utilise wigs, plain glass glasses, uh, false moustaches. You know, you, you think it's a joke. It works. Um, it's all about breaking up the outline, right? I mean, from the head up, these two guys are totally different, right? It's the same shirt, but the outlines are different. And we're not really good at typing all the people around us. We make this little outline around people, and that's about it. Um, so all you have to do is break that outline, and you can disappear into a crowd pretty easy. Now, one of the problems as a surveillance operator doing change of appearance is you have a limited time to do this. And people forget. You know, surveillance operators like goons. Any goons in here? Yeah? Yeah, there's a couple of goons in you here. You spend all day on your feet. So you've got a pair of shoes that you like and are comfortable. Yeah? They're fabulous. So, Shut up. <laughs> there's no place like home. There's no place like home. Um, so they'll change everything else, but their shoes won't change. So remember we said, you're on public transport, you're being observant. This is what you're looking for, the small details that people don't change. How often do you really look at a man's shoes? Thanks, Shawshank. <laughs> Watches. Again, people like their watch, especially ex-military, nice, glow-in-the-dark watch. Things that they forget to change, and the next time you see someone that looks different with the same watch, Make note. <laughs> Jewelry. Again, wedding rings, necklaces, women with earrings. So they're behind you. Oh, no, they're, not. <laughs> they're behind you. So what are they doing behind you? They will be conducting most likely standard ABC pattern. So we've got the target in red. Directly behind the target is the guy that is in control. Only one person is ever in control and has eyeball on the target. Behind him is the person that is backing, that is in a position to take over control. And on the opposite side of the road is the trail, slightly behind the target so they can observe at a distance. You can't do this with one or two people, okay? So if you think you're like, I'm going to follow that person, yeah, you're following them into a trap. So the target turns the corner. Now, has the target continued to walk or has the target stopped to wait to see who follows him around the corner? The trail being on the opposite side of the road can see this. They can pass the message that, no, the target has continued to walk up the road. So the guy in control crosses the road, the trail crosses and becomes control, the guy in control is now the trail, and the guy backing is now backing. You still have maintained control of the target, you are still imposing surveillance. And the other 15 guys in the team, 14 guys in the team, they again may be on parallel routes, maybe further back and can swap and change so that you can limit your exposure to the target. Now, from our perspective, we want to conduct anti-surveillance against these guys and girls. So we use the surroundings for example. When we're doing anti-surveillance, we want to identify them without letting them know we are trying to identify them, because that gives the game up. You want to know they're there so that you can either lose them to do what you need to do, or do what you need to do when they can't see you. So we can use the environment in subways, the sort of mirrors you see uh, in, in UK in the underground. 
walking along the street, window shopping. Window shopping is a great thing because windows are reflective. You're not looking for who's on the same side of the road as you, you're looking who's on the opposite side of the road, you're looking for the trail because they may become complacent, not being directly behind the target, not rotate as much, and if you keep seeing the same person on the other side of the road, potentially that is someone that has you under surveillance. Yeah. And so this is, this is kind of one of the, the things you see, a pattern you see. So when the CIA has trained people to do what they call counter surveillance routes, which are really anti-surveillance routes, one of the things they do is you've got to really learn that urban terrain. You have to learn where those mirrors are. You need to learn what, mir what windows work for you, where the choke points are, so on and so forth. So they really do invest a lot in having case officers really, really well n know how to really well run their anti-surveillance routes. Um, and to the point where case officers are like, I've been running anti-surveillance routes for three months now. When do I get my job? So you are in control here. You choose the environment. You choose the place. Again, if you're in a, a large mall, get on the escalators. It's natural for people to stand on the escalator and turn around and look around them and look behind them and talk to their friends. Gives you the opportunity to see who's one story below coming up. Now, we all carry mobile phones. So why would you want to use one of these? Use a pay phone. It gives you a reason to stop. It gives you a reason to look around you. Surveillance operators are trained. If the target stops, they need to have a reason for being there. So they don't just stop and turn their back and pretend they're not there. You know, they'll go into a shop or they'll go up to a store or they'll walk to a phone and pick it up and pretend they're doing something else. But you've already used that. They've got to find somewhere else. This is, this is called cover for action, by the way. It's basically the reason you're there. You all know the answer to this one. It's, you ha I'm here, I have a switch, and I'm here to put the stuff inside your network. You have a cover for action. There's a reason you are in that environment, and it's natural and smooth. So break that. So again, we can use natural choke points when we're out walking. You know the area, you know this is a one-way street and the only thing down the bottom of this street is a coffee shop that no one goes to. So anyone else walking down that street behind you is someone you're interested in. You could have areas where there is only one point to get from A to B that they have to transit through. Again, they would then have to take the long way around or push everyone through there, which gives you the opportunity to observe. Things that are less obvious. Most guys don't like to go in here unless they're with their wife or girlfriend. So if I go in here and another guy comes in, I'm interested, well, yeah, I'm interested in him. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well played, sir, well played. Indeed. But they have women in their teams, so they could put a woman in there, and that's not suspicious. Yep, but she's not following me in here, yeah? Again, make them make decisions. Why are you going in here? It may be obvious, but it may not be. Uh, in, in the Cold War times, these were places where packages were placed for people to go in and retrieve and collect data because people don't like to follow people into the men's room. So use it to your advantage. Again, if someone comes in there, it just gives you the opportunity to make a note of them and what they're wearing. Elevators. Firstly, would you get into an elevator with these two people? They seem so unhappy. They they're going to have a fight. So strange. Um, again, they have to make that decision. Do they put someone in a small metal box with you? At which point they are this far away and you can have a really good look at them. Also, if you get in an elevator and no one gets in behind you, press three or four floors and get off at your floor. And no matter what you see in the films, they are not going to run up 15 stories worth of stairs to beat you to the top. It doesn't happen. It also gives you a chance to make toast. Engage with them. If there's someone in there that's a bit suspicious, you think it might be a surveillance operator, you turn to them, and, it's, and this is the key thing, in your best British accent, you say, excuse me, my good man, my watch appears to have stopped. Could you tell me the time, please? But why a British accent? I mean, 
We have awesome accents, too. Have you ever noticed how in Hollywood movies all the villains are played by Brits? Maybe we just sound right. We're more focused. More precise. We're always one step ahead. And we're obsessed by power. We all drive Jaguars. Oh, yes. It's good to be bad. Oh. You know what <coughs> Didn't know. Thank you. So, we move on to hostile environments. This isn't Afghanistan or downtown LA. <laughs> Again, we're using the environment to our advantage. This is Agent X's favorite hostile environment. No one's surveilling me. Well, they we, are, yeah. but I'm wanting them to. Remember, they're wearing all this kit. They have to wear enough clothing to cover this kit. They ain't getting in the pool with you. Or the Turkish spa, by the way, is also really good. We can always use, also use misdirection. Again, they are looking for you to have interactions with people. They are trying to identify who you are meeting. Use this to your advantage. So when you meet someone in the street, shake hands with them. Or when I'm meeting my friend Trevor for a milkshake, I normally give him a big bro hug, yeah, or a full-on Jason Street awkward hug, or stand next to someone that's more of a target than you are. Yeah, that's, that's a classic trick. This worked for me for years. Again, use the environment. Go into a cafe. You control the environment. You can choose where to sit. You can see everyone that comes in. Make a note of everyone that comes in. When you read a paper, when you finish, take that paper, fold it up, and put it on the side, and leave. Put it in an awkward kind of special spot. Yeah. So like between the planters, right? So it doesn't get tidied away. They now have a decision. Has that paper got something in of importance? Do they leave the whole team watching that cafe to see who comes and picks up that paper? So awkward. And here's, or, the thi here's, a, here's, a, here's, a, here's a pro tip, by the way. If you've ever seen The Big Lebowski, you fucking Jackie Treehorn them too. So when they do find it, eh, 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 eh. Or they split the team in half and half watch the cafe and half continue to follow you. You have one at that point because now you have half the amount of people operating against you while you go and do your shit. We can also use their techniques. Um, remember from the start of the thing we gave a description of what the target looks like. So the surveillance team have been following you for six hours and all they're looking for is a red hat. Yeah? You can use change of appearance now, while I'm not saying carry wigs and mustaches and shit with you, just It doesn't work if you're not a pro. It's really embarrassing when your face falls off. Yeah. <laughs> take a bag, take your coat off, take your hat off, and then you change your appearance. <laughs> Maybe not your political persuasion, but just your appearance. Now, you're saying this is old school, which is where we are. This shit doesn't happen anymore. This shit's happening on Tuesday everywhere. So here we have Richard and Cynthia Murphy. They're so wholesome looking. So wholesome. They love barbecues. They had two small children. They lived in a small town in, in upstate New York. The neighbors thought they were lovely. They like hot dogs. Come on. They were actually Vladimir and Lydia Guriev. <gasps> They were deep cover Russian operatives that had been in the country since either the late 80s or the early 90s. Their children were born in the country. The what Russians were playing the long game. They came on the radar of the FBI. They started an operation against these people. And as a result, they identified a total of 10 deep cover Russian operatives. Look at how unhappy all these people are. That's because they got caught. 
Um, they were conducting surveillance against these people for nearly 10 years. Surveillance is a long game because you want them, you want their handlers, you want their handlers' bosses, you want everyone involved in that team. But you also want their side, you want, you want to know what they're, how they're operating, right? Because everyone, everyone in the surveillance game is playing by the same playbooks, right? So the, the way the Soviet, Soviets, sorry, the Russians surveil, yep. or the way we surveil, is exactly the same. Right? It's the same team makeups, it's the same stuff. Because it's really like a bicycle. It's got an optimal form, we're just going to run with it. There's not a lot of crazy change-ups that they run. Now, an interesting part of this operation was afterwards, after they'd deported them all, the FBI released video footage of surveillance they'd taken. Uh, now, we start with this one, this is, this is a very strange angle. This is a covert camera in a tree pointing directly down. This is someone picking up a package from a dead letter box. Now, when you pick up a package from a dead letter box, it's meant to be quick. Not rooting around in the yeah. shrubbery. Digging shit with a shovel attracts attention. Now, although they use technology here with the covert camera, it was the surveillance team that got them to that point and I had identified where this was happening for them to then use technology to their advantage. And again, with a dead letter box, don't use the same one because when you go back, there'll be a camera. So the second one, again... This is totally normal. This is a totally normal thing. We all do this. We all go for walks and then we go and we hide under bridges and, 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 and take something out of that, because that's normal. Unless you're playing Billy Goat Rough with your kids. That's right, yeah. yeah. Oh, this, so, in the next couple bits of video, I want you to look at how sloppy they got. We all have seen these techniques. These, these are pros. Literally, their life is on the line, and they've been doing this for 10 years. This is what pros look like. This is a brush pass. This is meant to be two people carrying the same item in a busy, crowded street. Because that's normal, right? Like, I mean, I just do that in, all the time. I, I find a tube, in, a tunnel in New York, and I'm just like, hey, man, here's my groceries. You got some groceries? That'd be great. Oh, this guy. So they, they Not need, a spy. They need to go back to school. That wasn't slick. Now, this guy is, is even better. This is a subway. Just we're hanging not, out. Yeah, we're not really acting suspicious. I want, no, he's not coming, no, I can't Because we all hang out in the subways of New York, right? Like, you gotta take the subway, you don't even wanna be on the subway anyway. Hello? You're not gonna hang out there. Yeah, so the FBI got bored, didn't they? And <laughs> they, they cut the footage. They edited the footage, I don't know how long the guy was loitering in there, but then eventually they start the footage again, and I'm, I'm here, quick adjust to the clothing, and we're off to do our brush pass. Again, slick in a busy, yeah, no. And again, all these camera angles are taken from covert cameras that we- And F remember, it's, it's, it's the FBI. They're inherently bureaucracy, right? <laughs> so somebody had to like fill out paperwork to be like, hey, can we put a camera in a public place and surveil? And you know, you'd have to get some lawyers involved and so on and so forth. So a lot of this stuff isn't, um, you know, it took a long time to set up, it's pretty, it's pretty sloppy on the part of the Russians. Now, remember earlier we said, you control the environment. Go into a cafe where you can see, you can observe, you are in control. So the, so these, so the two guys in the middle of the frame are the targets, of course. Right. Now, yeah. what they're actually doing isn't overly suspicious in a cafe, passing something between two bags. However, this footage is taken from a covert camera in a bag placed on a table about six feet away pointing directly at them. Huh, no one does that. So, ever. This thing about being observant and looking in and using your surroundings, but it also shows the length that a surveillance team will go to to get close enough to get the evidence they need. So, this is the other thing. They're putting, they're putting uh, uh, operators really close to the target. I mean, this is burning distance, right? At this point, I mean, this is, you, the, per, the person's leg is, is one of the uh, operators, and if you watch the full footage, there's other people that obviously have interactions with the leg. So there's like three FBI people in here. And they didn't spot them. 
and they didn't spot them. Bad on them. So, I say we can't cover everything in 45 minutes. So, in, in summary, use your environment. You are in control. You choose where you want to go and make them follow you, not you be where they're waiting for you. Right. You can set the tempo because they're, follow, they're following you. You're the leader. Set the tempo and then change it on them. They'll hate it. They won't like it. Make them make decisions. Again, make them make bad decisions. So they are showing out. They are making themselves obvious to you as the target. The best one is, if you can, divide and conquer. You either get them totally looking in the wrong direction or you get the team to split so you only have half the amount of people operating against you. Always make toast. Always be That's making toast. That's the key thing here. And if you do happen to be a target or you do, are doing something that maybe you shouldn't be doing, not that I'm saying anyone in here would likely to be a target of surveillance. That never happens. If you are doing something and you are going to meet someone, if you're a press and going to meet uh, a source, for example. You're buying bath salts with bitcoins. Yeah. Whatever. If you are ever in doubt and you're in that position, abort. You may be under surveillance, but abort so that you don't then draw someone else into their circle. Now, everything that we've said in this talk is in the public domain. I haven't given away anything that's super secret. I haven't knowingly broken the Official Secrets Act. That's important for you. I don't, I'm not covered by that. <laughs> so please don't arrest me when I try to leave the country, because that doesn't happen over here. And so that, yeah, and all this stuff is public. These, and all these, you read these books, they all cover the same stuff. So anyway. So that concludes the talk. Um, as we have run just over, we will take questions, but we'll do it in the chill out area so that the next speaker can get on here. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us right now. Cheers.